please give a warm welcome to George A. Hello there. Um, hi, my name is George A. I'm the co-founder and director of innovation at Greater Good Studio. You may have seen me in earlier such programming as the panel upstairs. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, one of the very first projects I got to work on in my career at Audio uh, was on insulin delivery devices, helping diabetics manage their condition. If I was doing my job correctly, I am helping change behavior to help people live longer lives. Makes sense, right? Later on in my career, um, I'm also working on packaging for Kool-Aid. And if I'm doing my job correctly, I'm helping people change behavior, and in this case, consuming enormous amounts of sugary water. Do you see the problem here? This is a lot easier for me to now notice because it was something that I can now tell looking back. But at the time, it was something I had to just do. That sort of like moment of uh, realization when you realize perhaps you're feeling compromised is a very challenging uh, position to be in. And I think it's something that in many of the industries of design and technology, you feel that compromise baked into the industry. It's something you feel kind of like numb to. You're so used to it. It's worth mentioning, you see, that design changes behavior, so therefore it absolutely matters who is asking for it, either positively or negatively. I don't think we spend enough time pausing to check who is asking for this change. So about seven, eight years ago now, uh, we started Greater Good Studio to make sure that we never put ourselves, myself, my team, in that same compromising position again. It's the kind of thing that we said, you know, wouldn't it be crazy if we had a design firm, a for-profit design firm, that never made those ethical compromises from the very start. So did anybody ever uh, practice piano as a kid? Like rehearsals? Yeah. So um, if you imagine there was a kid who would practice once a day uh, versus a kid that practiced maybe once a month, uh, we're the kid that practices every single day. So for the last eight years um, and about 100 projects in, we've only ever done work in the social sector for nonprofits, foundations, and local government. We're really good at this now, as you would imagine if you practice a lot. And the thing that we practice is human-centered design. I'm sure everyone has seen multiple sort of diagrams that describe process steps like this. But it's worth noticing, though, that human-centered design, just because it has humans at the center of it, doesn't inherently make it good. In fact, if I could tell you a little story about something that maybe some of you may be already familiar with, uh, it's the Juul e-cigarette. Uh, this is a product that has a um, massive footprint across the United States and across the rest of the world. And as it says here, Adam Bowen and James Monsies were pursuing master's degrees in product design at Stanford when they decided to do something about their smoking addictions. Quotes here from Stanford Magazine's alumni site. Uh, Monzies and Bowen approached smokers on campus and asked them what they loved and hated about the habit. Their complaints were consistent, fear of being seen with a cigarette and paranoia about smelling a smoke on a first date. What a great insight. Uh, their first prototypes were ad hoc assemblies of bespoke components and items found on drugstore shelves. They're practicing human-centered design. They're doing the very best job they can because of the training they got at Stanford. They are, they've done it right as far as that practice goes. Yet at the same time, they've had enormous devastating effect on public health across the country. The sort of rules by which you talk about what good means has to be brought into question. Like for design, and this is my go-to for Dieter Rams, essentially has standards that include things like design is aesthetic, uh, good design is unobtrusive. I would argue that they did right by all of those rules. And in doing so, they made this incredibly powerful product. If you digest all of this down, and many rules exist like this, it comes down to two primary rules. Form, how beautiful it looks, and its function, how well it works. If you follow those rules, you are supposed to end up with great design work, just like the jewel, if you don't watch out for who's asking. Now, in and of itself, there's nothing inherently wrong about these rules, but if design stayed in its lane, working on purely business problems, we would probably be all set but design and technology is entering and encroaching on more and more complex social issues. The kinds of ones that form and function no longer really seem appropriate anymore when you look at something as complex as uh, mass incarceration across America. The new modern day Jim Crow isn't something you can just solve through poster notes, and I know people are trying. What counts as good, you see, isn't really good enough, and I think it's a, a going on for a long time that we haven't noticed perhaps these guidelines around what we judge as good is borrowing too much from how we used to judge good from the business sector and arbitrarily applying it to the social sector. I don't think it's appropriate anymore. In fact, I think that my training as a conventional designer 
is actually making me a be a bit of a liability, and it stresses me out. So I want to offer instead three principles of good design that we studied, we tried to synthesize across those 100 projects that we did at our studio to try and see are there perhaps new alternative frameworks, an ethical framework perhaps, that could maybe um, add on top of uh, the canonical ones that I have used uh, by Dita Rams and others. Good design, I think, has some of these elements. Good design honors reality. Good design creates ownership. Good design builds power. These terms are actually, they sound new in the design field and perhaps even new in technology, but these are actually ancient words because they've been around for a long time in other disciplines, disciplines like anthropology, social work, and organizing. I think design can learn an awful lot from these adjacent disciplines that are equally obsessed with human behavior as we are. But without that sort of guidance, we might end up making more jewels, for instance. So let's think about each of these. My training says designers alter reality. How many people here have ever worked on a project that was the future of something? I've done a bunch of those, okay? My job as a, as, as a discipline says I am supposed to imagine the future as it is. What's troubling about that is that it means that the reality as it is today is deeply getting questioned. So when we say and suggest good design on this reality, I think it's especially important when you have someone like the orange dictator in uh, the White House openly questioning our current realities, honoring it as a principle, I think is becoming more and more important every day. When you look at the work that we did with the Hennepin County Medical Center, we're looking at new models for care, we noticed that uh, by traveling with our patients to the healthcare appointments, we saw that the complexity of what they treat and what they deal with on a daily basis means that they have many, many competing priorities for their day in addition to uh, going to these healthcare appointments. So it's very challenging to even sort of have a relationship with a primary care doctor. So honoring that reality is something that we had to do in order for us to make new ideas that can fit into the messiness of their lives. In many ways, we saw that learned experiences, which is probably the majority of what we have in the room, the expertise we have around learned experiences tend to trump lived experiences. And I would argue that if we can elevate lived experiences to be anywhere on par with learned experiences, we would have a completely different kind of design work. Next one. My training says designers retain ownership. It's very important to us that we know who did it, that we get the right credit, that we get the right award associated with the recognition. So in a design work, when we do it, we want to make sure that we are... Um, we get some sort of return. And it's incentivized in us, particularly in professional services, that we keep our clients somewhat dependent upon us. And then when you do it in the social sector, though, that obviously can cause lots of problems. So I would suggest that good design creates ownership in order to directly challenge our ability to create new dependencies. When we did work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Raising Places, we did work across six communities across the country, from urban, rural, and tribal, specifically try and see if we can build capacity for design at a community level. We had to essentially build design teams from both emergent and established leaders, but we knew that specifically the thing we had to do was not create new dependencies on us as designers because we live in Chicago and we're going to come back to Chicago. Can you imagine me showing up in Nebraska with this accent and not feeling like I'm going to be some bozo that's coming in and out? It's a huge problem. I didn't go on any of these trips, by the way. So in our work in creating ownership for design teams who don't really have this as their job, you have to create the safe spaces where contributing doesn't feel like it's extractive and doesn't feel like it's just going to go into a black hole. So the safety by which you can contribute with some sort of follow-up had to be what our design team ended up creating. What you see as a sort of mini principle is that people adopt the change they were a part of making. This is loosely our theory of change as a studio. How many times have you had an email, let's say, from uh, higher ups that said a new policy is happening to uh, roll out across the studio? Anybody had that? If you had been involved in creating that policy, do you think you would feel differently about it? We argued that the kind of adoption for change can only happen if you are part of it. And the more resistant you will be is a direct relationship to how little input you had. Last one. My training says designers hold power. And this is a little being a, being a little mean. I don't think it's just all designers. I think everybody has this. Most people's relationship to power is zero sum. Because of how little training we get to talk about it, because of how sort of little education we have about it being in our degrees and on our training and our disciplines, 
we think that power can only go one way, which is to lose it. So I have to get as much as I possibly can and retain it. So we would argue that if we want to do work in the social sector, good design actually builds power. It's about giving it away because when you give it away, it comes back to you much, much later typically, but comes back to you later. Uh, it comes back to you in a different format. When we did this last project that I want to highlight uh, for the Metropolitan Tenants Organization, we were trying to build technology that allowed tenants to sort of push back against the power asymmetry that they typically feel in relationship with their landlords. Is anybody here a tenant? Have a great relationship with your landlords? Maybe. So this one piece of technology, the sort of one feature that I want to highlight was the surfacing of legislation that the MTO put into Illinois law that says that if you're a tenant and has a wayward landlord, you can actually do self-remedy. You can actually use your rent money to fix the problem your landlord won't. And the technology makes that surfaces and makes it easy for you to write, that, write this uh, communication informing the landlord through this third-party service. We tend to find, you see, that people with the least power are often closest to the problem. So the source of inspiration tends to be from those who actually have no other means but to have worked through those problems. They tend to be at the front line of most issues. So can you look to them for inspiration? And can you look to make, give them more power in the design work you do? So in summary, number one, we value learned experiences but discount lived experiences. So my question for you is, how might your process honor reality? Whether that's design work, technology work, organizing, whatever. Number two, people adopt the change that they're a part of making. So how might your process create ownership? And then lastly, the people with the least power are often closest to the problem. So how might your process build power? Thank you very much. <laughs>